previously on G Brusco. Built in 1903. Uh, g'day, I'm uh, Fred the Flagman. Of the river Margaret, Margaret River. And of course, with the name of Gwalia, which literally means Wales. Um, how can I not go there? Uh, so, effectively, I would have done the Nullarbor in two days. Better vantage point to see Mag River. River. It is off to the. That's where I just was down on the beach, and you can see the river here meandering up the valley. All right. If I turn this and this around, you can see it snagging around the dunes there, and what looks looks like an osprey or a bird of prey uh, artificial nest just there above the tree line on the river and then uh, you can see people on the river fishing somebody on a kayak and then it widens out so if somebody did um, make a hole in that sandbank down there this river would uh, the river line would drop very rapidly indeed as you can see here no extensive fire damage uh, apparently it's uh, all to the further south of here so stand by for some Beautiful spot. All right, let's crack on. So you can see here that uh, one side of the road is uh, heavily fire damaged and the other side uh, was not. Uh, now it's uh, both pretty bad. So all through here uh, was recently damaged by the fires when I was on my way up from uh, Pemberton and had to bypass this uh, whole region. So you can see some of the Epicurean growth coming back on the trees here. Uh, which is a good sign, uh, but there's, there's certainly no kind of guarantees that uh, that particular tree is going to grow back. But um, yeah, quite quite sad to see the extent to which uh, has been burnt down here. Uh, you know, I, I, I know I have to understand that fire is part of the natural life cycle of plants in Australia, which uh, you know is still going to take me a while again to get my head around. But. government apparently is uh, starting to learn about uh, um, Aboriginal ways of managing the, the land with fire um, by having the different seasons as you might have seen on that uh, uh, that interpretation board at um, Margaret River Bay, uh, the mouth of Margaret River earlier, showing the different um, seasons of the Aboriginal calendar and that's how the cycle that they use uh, to treat the, the land with fire. Um, you know, I don't know why sometimes there's such an appetite to reinvent the wheel when something's been done for hundreds of years in a certain way and has worked. Uh, why, why not adopt it, you know? Uh, so it's a long time coming in my opinion. i 
extensive fire damage from here, but it, it looked like, uh, it looks like at least that the fire must have gone through here so quickly uh, that it didn't didn't do too much damage. Um, there's, there's, there's a lot of healthy looking trees amongst this, so that's another good sign. And that uh, the growth on the floor, the, the forest floor is uh, coming up so quickly is also a good sign. Because um, if the fire burned through here so intense, uh, it would have burnt the seeds, uh, the seed layer just underneath the topsoil, and then there wouldn't have been anything to come back. But uh, as you can see here, um, it's the fire has done its job of germinating the seeds below the surface, and they've all started coming up. I mean, we're only talking probably when was it through here, uh, mid December. Uh, it's now uh, mid February. Uh, yeah, it's only a couple of months. Uh, they got control of the fires around Christmas time, I think. So, yeah, pretty, pretty, pretty decent. So you can see around here, there's a lot of fire damage. We just uh, come into the National Park, the uh, Naturalist uh, Lewin Natural Park that uh, kind of hugs the coastline all the way from Cape to Cape. This is where one of the caves is. Uh, it's, it's the sign said it was open, so I've come in. You can obviously see there's quite a bit of uh, fire damage through here. But uh, we'll pop in quickly and, uh, and see just how bad it was. Just about to uh, enter Calgrove Cave. It's a self-guided uh, tour of the cave. It takes about 45 minutes. Uh, quite a bit of fire damage around here. There's a sign. Yeah. So time to switch on the old torch, and uh, yeah, hopefully nothing goes wrong. I've also got a backup torch uh, and the phone, of course. <laughs> Four foot high. It's too short even for me. So in this section of the cave, there's actually water on the floor. You can see there's a lot of moisture in here. The, um, the guy in the visitor center said some of the moisture might be around because of the fires, i.e. when they were trying to put them out or whatever. Because it's been quite dry recently. Hence the fires. And we're at the other end. Not quite 45 minutes, more like 10. See the roots coming through? 
of the vegetation above in search of some moisture, I imagine. Now you see there's nothing reflecting there because that's where there's water. Those roots hanging down are touching the water. Big roots coming through there and there. All right, so it's a bit chilly down here. We'll, uh, we'll head back up. I don't want to look straight at you because that happens. <laughs> All right, let's get topside. It looks like Google is sending me on another adventure. Uh, we're supposed to be going to a lookout in uh, Boyan up. The route we were supposed to go on uh, was, was closed because of fire damage, so it uh, rerouted me this way. And <laughs> it's increasingly becoming more and more kind of uh, off script. So I've just got the uh, rooftop tent up, as you've seen. I recorded it on the uh, Insta360, uh, so you can scroll around a little bit. Uh, let me just find. So that's what it looks like on. I've got it going off the back, so I can have the uh, the wolf pack boxes and uh, etc. on the front. If I had it coming off the side, it's slightly wider, so it would take up too much room on the roof rack. The line is looking good. Uh, I was worried that uh, with the added weight it would be sitting down on the back, but it's looking pretty level, so I'm quite happy with that. Uh, it takes about um, between 5 and 10 minutes to put this hand up, and roughly that to take it over and put it back down, to be honest with you. I'll give you a quick little look inside. As I said before, the weakest part of this tent by a long shot is the ladder. It uh, just feels cheap as hell. So, uh, leave my flip flops at the bottom, even though there's space up the top, you'll see. Alright, so I've currently got it so all the fly sheets are closed. Essentially, that's it. So, I've got this uh, quilt in. The quilt is uh, a new one I just bought that is 50% uh, uh, down and 50% feather, and as you can see, it kind of compacts down to maybe a centimeter or two. This then is the mattress underneath which is about five centimeters but it's it's quite firm. I like my beds quite hard so you know it works for me. Um, this is just uh, off a queen bed so I'm gonna try and get a, a, a double or maybe a single because it's not as thick as a normal mattress just because I like it tight and uh, this is coming out. So as you can see, there's a space here, so you can put shoes and whatnot. Let's uh, go a little bit in here. So this is inside, and uh, the mattress is roughly uh, 130 by uh, 2.1 meters. Uh, so it's, it's you know it's basically like a double bed. It is the same size as a double bed. Uh, so yeah works for me very well. I've also got these uh, rooftop things open just to let some heat out because it has been boiling both yesterday and today. Um, you can see there's a fly sheet on the outside which you can take off if it gets like ridiculously hot. 
uh, but uh, there's a bit of air circling up here so it's not too bad I always sleep with my head towards the front but that's personal choice you've got a pocket here which I keep bungee ropes which when I'm taking it down I just pass them through to get the fly sheets kind of coming in to help pack it away and there's another one down there which I use to keep my personal items in now the um, underneath here there's little things with velcro on it and underneath the mattress there's velcro underneath the mattress there's velcro straps but once you put the mattress cover on it those are redundant so I'm working on a, a, a workaround uh, as you can see I keep all of these down uh, but that's a personal choice just to get some air flowing through and it's boiling so I try wherever possible to keep gaps to a minimum make sure no bugs come in you can see when these are closed up there's still a little gap for midges and uh, down here where the, uh, the supporting beam comes down you know down to the just try and where the hinges are there's a little gap through you may be able to see light down there but we're talking very minuscule gaps really there's a bit of um, you know sway with it in the wind but it's not too bad it was quite breezy last night and uh, I slept really well uh, the good thing about having it orientated this way is I can also get out onto the front of the roof rack as you can see at the moment I've had to take off um, the jerry can in the corner because that support beam cuts the corner so I'm gonna have to uh, see if I can move everything slightly this way so I can move the jerry can holder uh, across by maybe two to three centimeters and then uh, I'll be able to pass that support wire passed it without me taking the jerry can off uh, otherwise um, there's a little bit of jiggy poggy <laughs> needed there uh, as you can see on this side underneath um, I still haven't taken off this but uh, I'll probably do that today I was worried uh, last night because it got so cold that I might have some condensation build up under here another one of these velcro things so the velcro pad is is there you know so as soon as you put that on yeah it's redundant i don't know if they're expecting you to take off all the bedding um every single time but i'm certainly not going to be doing that so i will invent a workaround um there's a little bit of sway in this with the suspension on the Jeep. I don't know if that's because of the upgrades I had, uh, but, you know, you don't move around that much uh, when you're sleeping. Um, maybe, maybe doing other stuff, but <laughs> haven't tested that out yet. But, uh, yeah, so far I'm quite happy with this. Um, as I say, the, the, the one uh, thing I don't like about it is the ladder. And as I understand it from the forums and everything, nobody likes the ladder. I don't know why Front Runner uh, won't do it with a telescopic ladder or some other ladder that you can upgrade to. I asked them if I could upgrade one. They said no. That is the only one that comes with it. Uh, and they don't sell a replacement uh, telescopic. It's ludicrous, really. Front Runner, if you're listening, just listen to your customers. Also tried to buy an awning from Front Runner. They sell them everywhere apart from Australia. I asked them why not in Australia. I was told because they wouldn't be competitive here. I said, well, newsflash for you guys. None of your stuff is competitive. It's all overpriced, but I buy it because it's quality. So sort it out, Front Runner. You may also be able to make out this uh, slight dimples in this baseboard already I've uh, literally used it once and where your knees go in 
you can you can feel the dimple in already. I like the fact you've got a bit of a space to put shoes or whatnot, but yeah, you just run your hand across this and this it just bumps all the way. And I'm hoping that's not signs that uh, it's going to deteriorate quickly. Only time will tell. So far, so good. So this is uh, Hamlin Bay. Uh, Hamlin Bay is quite famous for having um, stingrays come up quite close to shore. Uh, it's been quite blustery today, so I'm not sure they will. Uh, around this spot where the old jetty used to be, uh, should be a good spot to see them. But, uh, I don't think there's any. Somebody appears to be driving on the beach all the way down there. Um, I don't think you're supposed to. Anyway, this will be a very nice spot for uh, sunset. I will come back later with my camera and we'll try and get something. Good morning. Well, we just had a lovely night's sleep in uh, Hamlin Bay, and uh, now we're off down to the southern tip of the Cape to Cape uh, to Cape Lewin and Cape Lewin Lighthouse. That's where the Indian Ocean meets the Southern Ocean. And uh, depending on the uh, weather conditions uh, of the last couple of days, uh, sometimes it's quite easy to see the delineation between the two oceans. So we'll see if we can spot that today. Um, if it's been quite um, stormy recently, that tends to get mixed up and becomes uh, less kind of evident. But uh, we'll, we'll see if we can uh, pick it up today. And there's another lighthouse there, which is the uh, tallest one in WA, I think, or something like that. Uh, we'll probably stop in Augusta for uh, a spot of breakfast or a cup of tea uh, on the way down. Uh, we're just going down Caves Road, which is the, the road I was saying that kind of just hugs the coastline all the way from cave to cave. And uh, we will be passing a couple more caves. I don't think I'm going to do them today just because uh, we need to get back to Bunbury today. Um, going up to Perth tomorrow to uh, try and watch the, the light festival. And they've got a couple of hundred drones doing light formations in the sky over Elizabeth Quay. Uh, so this is a flying visit basically down to this uh, corner because I didn't want to miss it out and I wanted to test out the uh, the rooftop tent uh, which so far is going extremely well. Uh, this quad lock mount on the other hand uh, is very very disappointing so far so uh, yeah. Anyway, let's crack on. this part of uh, Caves Road hasn't been affected by the fires and this is how it usually looks all the way up and down up and down Caves Road uh, beautiful lush green it's uh, it's a really pleasant drive uh, Caves Road and uh, you know you, you could probably spend a good couple of weeks just traveling the length of Caves Road stopping at all the uh, the different attractions uh, vineyards, cellar doors, mazes, sculpture parks, galleries, etc. Uh, the place is just absolutely smattered with them. This is Jewel Cave, which is apparently the best uh, show cave um, along this stretch. Um, I've been there before, back in 2002. It is a uh, quite spectacular cave, actually. Uh, there's a cafe there as well. Uh, so if you get a chance, I uh, strongly recommend coming down to this neck of the woods, especially if you're a bit of a uh, a geologist nut like myself, um, it, it's really uh, worthwhile. So it turns out that the lighthouse is under restoration.
fantastic picture. <laughs> This is the interpretation center of the lighthouse. McDavid's very angry. He doesn't talk a lot, but he says it's dangerous. The lighthouse is not a toy. Oh, that's I just want cool. to help. I've seen them put oil on them. Plenty of time. They have on duty. Mr. Francis was working. He's one of the other keepers. And he was thinking what weather it was. And my hands got caught. We were in the car. All through the night. Then I was in the hospital for so long. Seven old weeks. Pretty hard to time the shoes now. So these uh, cottages were inhabited right up until 1998. A shipwrecked adventurer. At 13, the fair winds blew me all the way from Germany. And although I became one of the best boxers in Queensland, my closest script was as assistant lightkeeper at Cape Horn. That's quite cool. Now, my labor here was made more pleasant by a countess of Sakiva. It's a pretty, very charming. There's a list of the lighthouse keepers.
Okay, so as you can see, the Nidus is totally uh, enveloped uh, in refurbishment works. But apparently we can go around to have a look at where the two oceans meet. Yeah, sadly you can't see the uh, lighthouse, but uh, it is 56 metres high and is uh, the largest in WA, third largest in Australia. Yeah, looks like uh, it's going under some extensive renovation works, doesn't it? You can see we're on a little bit of a peninsula here. We're surrounded by uh, marine conservation zones. You can see up the coast that way towards Hamlin Bay and this way towards uh, well I guess towards Albany and Esperance and all that looking uh, eastwards. Now out there uh, roughly around about this point is where the Indian meets the Pacific Ocean uh, sorry the Indian meets the Southern Ocean. Uh, last time I came there was <laughs> like a sparkling actual line in the in the sea uh, where you can see the color difference between the Indian and the Southern Oceans. Uh, today not so much, not from this point anyway. I'm going to see if I can get behind the lighthouse. I'm not sure if I can. Uh, might be able to see it better from another another area. I love these little crappie um, outcrops they've got but you can see how dangerous it was to ship in. They go out quite far. You can see the breaking uh, reefs off in the distance. Quite a perilous stretch. Uh, the Southern Ocean is dotted with very perilous uh, bits like this. So I'll give it a wide berth, I guess. We're just on the uh, Bustleton jetty now. We come up to uh, Bustleton. Got my uh, Insta360 on pole above me. I'm going to walk to the end and get the train back if I can be at the end for 20 past three. Uh, the jetty itself is about 2.1 uh, kilometers long, if memory serves me right. They got this little uh, kind of enclosed swimming area right next to it. So you can have a better look. Just on the foreclosure. It's very nice. That's the uh, visitor center at the end. You've got to pay to come on here. Uh, it's $24 if you're walking, but if you want to get the train as well, I think it was something like $12. So, as I say, I'm going to try and get to the end so I can get the train back. So, uh, I'll just get my skates on. Right at the very end of this is. Um, right at the very end is. Uh, Aquarium right at the bottom. So you can go down and you can look at the fish that's at the base of the jetty. And uh, I've done that in the past and uh, I'm not going to do it again, but it's as well worth a visit if you've never been before. Alright, so we'll catch up on the other end.
So we made it to the end of uh, Buston and Jetty. It's actually uh, 1.84 kilometers, not two. I'll just tell you. You can see they got uh, signposts with uh, distances to some of the famous cities in the world. And apparently we're actually looking north here. why London is actually that way. <laughs> you can see that uh, column of uh, smoke coming up. That was the fire we passed earlier on. Still go in probably two hours later. So we're going to get the train uh, back down the jetty. These are both through 20 past three. It's now no, no 10 past three. Looking up the beach that way is up towards uh, Bunbury, where we'll be in a couple of hours. Beautiful day. Bustle and Jetty was a good uh, walk to the end and uh, a nice little train ride back. Uh, to do the return trip, uh, you can get the train up and back or you can walk one way and get the train the other. Um, it's $15 um, or you can pay $20 to have access to the aquarium at the other end as well. So that's a uh, good money and that money goes towards the upkeep of the jetty itself. So that's well worth it. Uh, this site that I'm at here is the site of the original jetty that was destroyed uh, by bad weather back in the day. And you can see the new jetty which is uh, just over there. Yeah, it's uh, 1.841 uh, kilometers, not 2.1 as I originally said. Um, my fault there. Uh, but yeah, it's a nice little walk. I think it took me about uh, 25 minutes to walk to the end. Uh, trains run from this end on the hour and on the way back on the half hour. So, train line, train ride takes slightly longer than it did me walk. But there we are, uh, top uh, attraction in Bustleton, I highly recommend it. Yeah, really parking rules have been applied here, yeah, just come back first to find Delilah Park next to this beautiful looking poison spider. Very nice indeed. So, Delilah's got some company. I like it. Next week on Jeep Roscoe. Just being here in 1964 and seeing the bluebird go streaking across here. So we made it to uh, Wake Rock. See the color on the water. It's an old uh, quarry that's been filled in.